reminder for our community of faith as we gather in person and as we gather virtually that today is the virtual Penridge Crop Hunger Walk. Today. In our narthex, you will find an area with a sign that has been designated as drop slots for your offering for the crop walk. And if you go on your computer and simply Google Penridge Crop Hunger Walk, you will have a very easy guide to follow sharing an online donation. A special reminder that I became aware of this year was that for the Penridge Crop Hunger Walk, 25% of whatever is collected goes to Penridge Fish. We know again that the needs are great, and so I encourage your support that even though we cannot gather in person and actually walk, physically make the walk, that you still be mindful of the needs in our community and that you provide an offering to this wonderful community fundraiser. Also, again, I want you to remember and think chicken pot pie. If you go to St. Paul's United Church of Christ website, very easily there has been a little button on the right hand side that has been designated for our chicken pot pie sales. Very, very easy. You order online, you pay online, which makes it very, very easy the day that the orders will be picked up. And all that information will come out to you in the weeks ahead that you will simply have to stop and get your delicious bag of quarts of chicken pot pie and peppered cabbage, whatever you have ordered. Be mindful of that. Any questions, any concerns, again, um, don't hesitate to leave a message on the church office recorder. Don't hesitate to email Stacy. She will find out the answer for you, whatever your question may be. Also, see, we are not a quiet, laid-back church. We are very busy, folks. Operation Christmas Child will not be missed this year because of other challenges that may be for us with gathering in person and limitations that we may feel um, in figuring all that out. There are no limitations to the amount of mission projects and ministry projects that we can be involved in and lift up and support. On Friday evening, I distributed boxes from the front porch of the parsonage. Kevin helped me in that. There is a guesstimate, since I'm not good at always keeping accurate track of numbers behind the scenes, of about 15 boxes that were distributed. I see Kevin sitting back there with boxes, and I think there's some in the narthex, which makes me mindful that I'm sure there were questions asked as people gathered this morning, if I did not get my box Friday evening, when can I get my box? And apparently they will be available to you um, as you leave worship today, and I encourage you to take a box with you. Um, there is very, very helpful information um, on your selections. Um, that you can make for whether you select a boy or girl and whatever age you select, there will be more details coming out um, on how we will bring that project and celebrate that project to its completion. Again, if you Google Operation Christmas Child, they have made it very easy to put your box together online. Um, so we have a lot of options um, that come before us that we can choose and being a part of these mission and ministry projects. The Upper Rome devotion booklets for November and December are also available and were distributed um, from the Parsonage front porch on Friday. But folks, please, um, this is teamwork. So if you didn't get a book, <clears throat> you want to make arrangements to get a book, call, leave a message, send a text to Stacy send her an email, we will make it happen. 
Uh, again, just because we can't do things in the normal routine of the ways we've done them, it does not mean that they don't happen and that the life of the church stops. Lots of things to pray about. Individuals, events, wonderful, wonderful opportunities to be the hands and the feet and the voice of our Savior. Please pray about the way that God is guiding you in this time to be his faithful servant and to be a part of these wonderful mission and ministry opportunities. Please share with me now as the people of God gathered in this time and in this place our call to worship. Do you remember who first invited you to worship? Do you remember the first community of faithful ones you joined? A nursery class who welcomed you with care and open arms? A youth group who accompanied you with energy and open minds? A small group meeting in someone's home? A congregation, large or small, rural or urban, quiet folk, or rowdy ones? Do you remember the God you have come to worship? The one who delivered Israel from Egypt, the maker of earth and sky, the ground of all being, the God of Jesus, born of Mary. Let us pray. Great God, the beauty of creation reminds us of the beauty of your way. Your teachings bind us together as pilgrims on a common path towards abundant life for all. Your laws are sweeter than honey in a honeycomb. Guide us towards your path, God, and lead us away from dangerous roads so our words and the meditations of our hearts may always be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is not only important that we go to God with our individual prayers of confession, but also that when we gather together in community, that as a community we also offer to God our prayer of confession. Please join me responsively as we share in our call to confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Let us pray. Forgive us, God, when we forget you, speaking and acting and organizing as though you are not here. For still, we fashion our own deities to lead us on our way political ideas that claim unquestioned allegiance, material pursuits that set our devotion in commodities, religious self-righteousness of the right or left that baptize our prejudices. Forgive us, O oh God, when we forget you, failing to see you in neighbor, failing to care for you in creation, failing to recognize your spirit in our own being. Forgive us, O oh God. Amen. Dear family of God, God 
does not forget. God remembers, and in doing so, remembers us. Remembers us with love that puts us back together within and with others. Remembers us with grace that closes the door on fear and opens our lives to welcome and welcomed renewal. God remembers us back to life. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today, we are going to talk about something that everybody likes going to. Parties. Raise your hand if you have ever been to a party before. What was the occasion for the party you went to? What was the reason for it, Simon? A birthday party? Have you been to anything other than a birthday party, Faith? Not coming to mind right now. There's lots of reasons that people have parties. Birthday parties are a really big reason, but there can be Halloween parties. Maybe not this year with the coronavirus. There can be Christmas parties or New Year's Eve parties, or maybe even end of school year parties. Like I said, lots and lots of reasons why people have parties. So today we're going to pretend, and I want you to pretend that you are going to have a birthday party. So, you've gone shopping, you've bought all the food, you've purchased the cake, you've bought some decorations, maybe party hats for the guests to wear, you've hung up all the decorations, you've planned games for the party guests to play, and most importantly, you've sent out invitations. And you hear back from the people that you invited, and they say, I'll be there. Looking forward to it. Can't wait. And then, the day of the party comes. And you know what happens? Nobody comes to the party. How would that make you feel? Sad. Maybe disappointed. Maybe even a little bit angry. Well, today I want to tell you about a story that Jesus told once. He told a story about a king who was having a party for his son. And he invited lots and lots of people. And when the day of the party came, the king sent his servants out into the courtyard to gather all of the party guests. And pretty soon, those servants found out that nobody could come to the party. Every person had an excuse. Some people said, oh, I'm too busy. And others said, I've got other plans that are more important. Well, later on, the king sent some more servants out to try to gather the party guests to come. And still, nobody would come back to the party with him. So finally, the king decided that those he had invited did not come because they didn't deserve to come. They missed out on the party. Now the party that Jesus was talking about was actually a party thrown by God in heaven for all of eternity. It's a once in a lifetime party and it lasts forever. And people have been talking about this party for more than 2,000 years. Now I want you to know that Jesus has invited you and his invitation is right here in the Bible. And his invitation is for you, and for me, and for your friends, and your family, and your neighbors, and for everybody who's worshiping here this morning in church, and for all of the people who are watching church from home. We are here to celebrate the good news that Jesus has brought to us. And that good news is that Jesus died in our place taking our sins upon himself on the cross so that everyone who accepts that invitation can have eternal life in heaven with God someday. Now I hope that you guys and everybody who is listening 
will accept that invitation from Jesus. You can read about it in the Bible. You can pray to God about it. And find out what it is that you have to look forward to in eternity. Jesus says we don't want to miss out on this invitation or this party in heaven. Will you pray with me, please? Repeat after me. Dear God, we look forward to the day when we can celebrate the gift of your son with you. We know that you are preparing a place at your table just for us. We will be there. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. It is always a blessing to have you come on our altar steps and share those messages for children of all ages. God bless you and your ministry here with us at St. Paul's. As we prepare our hearts and our ears and to open ourselves to God to hear this full parable of the wedding banquet, let us first go to our God in prayer. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen for the words of God in this reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 1. Once again, Jesus used stories to teach the people. The kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a king gave a wedding banquet for his son. The king sent some servants to tell the invited guests to come to the banquet, but the guests refused. He sent other servants to say to the guests, the banquet is ready. My cattle and prize calves have all been prepared. Everything is ready, come to the banquet. But the guests did not pay any attention. Some of them left for their farms and some went to their places of business. Others grabbed the servants, then beat them up and killed them. This made the king so furious that he sent an army to kill those murderers and burn down their city. Then he said to the servants, it is time for the wedding banquet, and the invited guests don't deserve to come. Go out to the street corners and tell everyone you meet to come to the banquet. They went out on the streets and brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. And the banquet room was filled with guests. When the king went in to meet the guests, he found that one of them wasn't wearing the right kind of clothes for the wedding. The king asked, friend, why didn't you wear proper clothes for the wedding? But the guest had no excuse. So the king gave orders for that person to be tied hand and foot and to be thrown outside into the dark. That's where people will cry and grit their teeth in pain. Many are invited, but only a few are chosen. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Today's parable from the Gospel of Matthew compares the kingdom of God to a wedding banquet. At first glance, this is a jarring story. Certainly not warm and fuzzy. Disturbing 
and unpleasant. We hear that after many of the invited guests refuse to attend the wedding banquet, the king opens up his house to everyone the servants can find. He throws open the banquet hall and everyone, good and bad alike, are invited to come and share in the wedding banquet. When the king went in to meet the guests, he notices one of them is not dressed as they should be. Friend, why didn't you wear proper clothes for the wedding? We find the guest speechless. The guest has no excuse for the king, and so the guest is thrown out, and we hear it is outside into the dark that he is thrown, where people will cry and grit their teeth in pain. Why would Jesus tell such a story? Why would God do this? We are familiar with hearing in our scripture passages of Jesus caring for the poor and the burdened. They are favored. They are provided with better options. God is the one who teaches that fineries, riches, matter less than spirit. There are many pastors, and rightfully so, to humble myself, I will tell you, will not preach on this parable today. I share this reading with you only because I encourage us not to avoid the difficult passages. Maybe this is a good passage for us to ask questions, to wrestle with questions. Maybe this is a good passage for us to be reminded of an old Benedictine practice of reading and studying scripture that is not a scholarly approach, but an approach where we read the passage through several times, simply thinking about the words written, meditating on the story, praying to God, offering and giving to him our questions, contemplating what this whole passage, what this mystifying parable could mean. But this is a parable and a story that we have been given, and parables and stories that Jesus shared with us spoke in symbols and with levels of irony. There are too many layers in this challenging passage this morning for us to unpack. But we are going to wrestle with this one question. If we look closer and we go deeper into the passage, what asking made Jesus, as we ask Jesus, what he may truly be talking about when he refers to the wearing of proper clothes? As 21st century Christians, We cannot deny in our country that we struggle within a culture of materialism. We know what it means to make a fashion statement. To clothe ourselves with material riches. On the larger scale, that might refer to bigger and better cars, bigger and better vehicles, bigger and better homes. We hear the term to dress for success. We know about designer clothes. When my mother-in-law recently passed away, I did have the opportunity to speak a eulogy at her service. And the very first memory that I shared 
was when I met her for the first time. On a Friday night, when in January of 1979, the woman that her son Kevin was dating came to meet her in blue jeans and a typical winter sweater. And there she sat in her Queen Anne chair with her cashmere sweater and her string of beautiful pearls. What an impression that made on me. And she truly was our matriarch, as I've shared with you. Then in her recent passing, because we shared in the same size of clothes, I had the opportunity to go through what I thought was going to be one closet in her front bedroom. It turned out to be a back closet, both sides. It turned out to be several drawers as I went through layers and layers and layers of clothes. This is not a criticism to her or to any of us. One of my first charge cards was from Fashion Bug, which was the fashion statement to make in the 1970s to buy clothes from that store. For my mother-in-law, it was Alfred Dunner. But I think this passage really encourages us and reminds us to look at these holy scriptures not in a literal sense. There is no literal interpretation that I come to provide on that moment when Jesus met that guest in the banquet hall about the proper clothes that Jesus might be referring to in the par parable. Not in a literal sense of clothes. But I can wonder, and we can wonder together, about Paul's letter that he wrote to the Colossians, where I think he gives us a glimpse of the kind of clothing that is worn by the citizens of God's realm. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. But Paul doesn't stop there. Because as a prisoner, when he writes to the struggling church in Ephesus, he says, finally, let the mighty strength of the Lord make you strong. Put on all the armor that God gives so you can defend yourselves against the devil's tricks. We are not fighting against humans. We are fighting against forces and authorities and against rulers of darkness and powers in the spiritual world. So put on all the armor that God gives. Then when that evil day comes, you will be able to defend yourself. And when the battle is over, you will be standing firm. Be ready. Let the truth be like a belt around your waist. And let God's justice protect you like armor. Your desire to tell the good news about peace should be like shoes on your feet. Let your faith be like a shield, and you will be able to stop all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Let God's saving power be like a helmet, and for a sword, use God's message that comes from the Spirit. Never stop praying, especially for others. Always pray by the power of the Spirit. Stay alert and keep praying for God's people. As I so often do when sharing that passage with you, I went to my discipleship study Bible that I went to when we talked about the book of Revelation a few weeks ago, and it guides us in this particular letter by Paul. It says these verses do not defend human warfare, but illustrate 
the Christian life as part of the cosmic struggle between God and the forces of fallen creation. The war against the forces that seek to dominate and destroy God's creation is fought not with the traditional tools of battle which destroy life, but with weapons that build community and nurture reconciled and nurture reconciled relationships. With our clothes come these accessories. The belt, the armor, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, the sword, guiding us into the way of God's truth and his justice and the good news about his peace, faith, God's saving power, God's message of good news that we have to share. Folks, we are in a battle. We are battling against this pandemic. And in the background of the pandemic continues to go on a battle which is also ours, a battle against domestic violence, against child abuse, against human trafficking, against addictions. We battle against complacency, conformity, being content with the way things are. Now more than ever, we, when, we need to recognize that when we are down, feeling lost, filled with anxiety and fear, that Christ continues to clothe us. Scripture tells us he expands our wardrobe for all occasions of life, including the accessories. We know that the Christian life is not a problem-free life. Bad things still happen. But God is near to us. And he can and he will help us through all times. In another of Paul's letters, and this time writing to the church in Philippi, he offers words of encouragement in the name of Christ. Rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Many Bibles call this a letter of joy. Paul in this same letter goes on to say, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about good things. Concentrate on what is good, not bad. My brothers and sisters in Christ, from wherever you gather this morning, know that grace is freely given by God's amazing love, and as a result, in gratefulness and thanksgiving, our God, our King, calls us to live as God's people. How's your wardrobe? Are you wearing and sharing God's amazing love, his tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience? Are you adding God's accessories? Wearing and sharing God's truth, God's justice, and God's peace. May we be clothed with Christ. May we live in Christ by rejoicing in the presence of God, by focusing on the good and not the bad, by practicing our faith, loving one another, being compassionate, patient, gentle, and kind, remembering that the God we serve leads us to joyous living, to abundant life, to a life that while not free from troubles, 
is rich and deep and full of grace and peace. A peace which Paul calls a peace which passes our understanding. And to God, and God alone, be all the glory this day and every day. Amen. Remaining open to our loving God, let us go to him with our prayers of the people, pausing for moments of silence throughout the prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, let us remember in prayer those who suffer the brokenness of grief, of friends and loved ones who have died in this week, or in times more distant, yet still fresh with pain and longing. Let us remember in prayer those broken in body or mind or spirit, those who are ill and hospitalized, those treated for cancer, or other diseases, those who are depressed. Let us remember in prayer those whose brokenness is in relationship with partner or child or parent, in vocation or friendship, 
estranged from hope or from God. Let us remember in prayer the brokenness in creation. Rivers polluted and hillsides stripped. Overabundance hoarded and need ignored for denial of natural crises. Let us remember in prayer the brokenness among nations and peoples for growing accustomed to war, for achieving ends with violence, for demonizing those who differ from us. And let us remember in prayer the one to whom we pray, whose way is love, whose wisdom is justice, whose heart is compassion, whose promise and call is peace. Remember us, O oh God, and make us whole. Amen. We gather together today in person and virtually. We are a community of people who want to follow Jesus. We share so much with those early Christians who struggled in the work of the gospel, but also found joy in the Lord, joy in the life they shared together. No matter what we are carrying this day or what we face, we are not alone. We share what we have so that others will find the same welcome and the same joy that we have known. Together as a community of faith, let us offer to God our prayer of dedication and also share together in praying the prayer that he has taught us to pray his disciples in this 21st century. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for all the gifts you generously give to us. Gifts that we now dedicate to you. May they be faithfully used for the building of your kingdom here on earth. We continue to pray in one voice saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we conclude our time of worship together, we share in a litany of blessing that is based on Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, remember these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, remember these things. Rejoice in God, help one another. We depart in the peace of Christ. We depart in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.